good evening, everybody. We've uh, we've given it the requisite five minutes to uh, let folks join in. Uh, so we're going to get started, and uh, if if more people join, uh, that's fine. Um, Jay Lee, can you give me just a thumbs up so I make sure that I can you hear me? Okay, thanks. Um, all right, so uh, welcome everybody to our first uh, virtual uh, post COVID public comstat. Um, especially the residents that are that are tuning in. Um, we uh, it, it's been a while uh, with uh, uh, with COVID and everything, and this is certainly not the most ideal way to to run an interaction with the community, but. Uh, it's uh, going to have to do for now, at least until uh, we can get uh, more people vaccinated and start to get back to business as usual. Uh, I just want to welcome a couple of uh, special guests from the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, the Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Karen Peck and uh, Christopher McKee from the U.S. Attorney's Office as well from the Department of Justice. So they're, uh, they're going to have an opportunity to chime in and talk about some of our partnerships uh, and, and how we work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. But um, I just wanted to welcome them as well. Um, it's uh, this is our first time with the a Zoom meeting like this, this large and in a public forum. So I just ask if everybody uh, bears with us, and in case there, are, I shouldn't say in case there's technology issues, but uh, when there are technology issues, I'm sure that will happen. Um, we will uh, work uh, quickly to try to fix it. Um, so just a brief kind of opening remarks, uh, you know, 2020, as, as everyone has said, was a, was a difficult year, a challenging year for law enforcement, um, not only here in Hartford or here in the state of Connecticut, but a, across the entire country, uh, from COVID, as I mentioned, to the, the tragedy with George Floyd, um, resulting in a police accountability bill here in Connecticut, uh, to our street racers, our pop-up parties, our fireworks in March, which hopefully we will not see again, um, increase in, in shootings, uh, again, not just here, but, but across the country, uh, statewide, a, a massive increase in larcenies, in uh, auto thefts, and property crime in general. Uh, I just want to say that um, I couldn't be more proud of the way the women and men of the Hartford Police Department responded to those issues in a difficult climate. Uh, they really stepped up um, and, uh, and did some remarkable work in 2020 and into 2021 in some uh, conditions that uh, I've never seen before. Global pandemic, um, public scrutiny, um, and, and just really, uh, really did a great job. While we have numbers uh, that are coming out of 2020 that we would certainly need to improve on, and everyone's goal here is to improve on them, um, we definitely did a, I will say that we did a better job here of containing some of those criminal, uh, those crime issues than a lot of other places. Some folks saw uh, double digit increases and, and doubling of, of shootings and homicides. And um, it was through the efforts of the people on this call and the folks that, that, that work for them that we did not see, uh, luckily, some of those, those, those really incredible numbers uh, that other places across the country did see. Um, so even with snow on the ground and, uh, and a winter uh, upon us, we still continue to see some of these issues. But I can say that between the folks here at HPD and our, uh, our partners, uh, two of which are represented here on, um, on, on the public comm staff, but uh, our partners in the FBI and the DEA and the state's attorney's office, um, parole, probation, uh, it's really been a team effort. We've, we've uh, forged some great uh, partnerships some new ones with a new state's attorney coming in um, and some existing ones that we've uh, strengthened through, uh, you know, through dealing with these difficult times and, and trying to come up with ways to figure out how to, to keep the community safe altogether. Uh, and I think tonight's ComStat, you'll start to see uh, that it is making a difference. Um, the numbers so far this year um, are, are looking good. Uh, never satisfied, we'll always uh, strive to improve, uh, but we're, we're definitely uh, headed in the right direction. Um, being cognizant of time and wanting to get into the numbers and uh, exactly what the police department is doing and, and, uh, and, and how crime looks out there, uh, I'll cut it there. Uh, but just a, a matter of housekeeping, uh, questions can be submitted at, at the, at the, uh, in the Q&A um, section and we will uh, answer the questions at the end. Um, 
uh, of the presentation. So if, if folks have any questions, uh, they can go ahead and, and submit them through that Q&A block. Um, with that said, um, Officer Lawler, if you want to put up, if you have the uh, citywide stats, if you want to put those up quick. I might have thrown you there. Well, with the there's our our first technology glitch, which we uh, hopefully we got the first one out of the way, and we'll be able to move past it. But the the overall um, part one crime citywide to date in our first uh, month and a half or so into the new year is down 16.8%. Uh, um, that translates into 111 less part one crimes uh, in the first month and a half or so of the year. Um, so that is uh, that is a good place to be. We've we're at, you know one of the most serious. Oh, there we go. Uh, one of the most serious issues that we saw last year was our our uh, shootings. Uh, we're looking at a 26 percent reduction in that year to date, which uh, equates to six less um, shootings. Um, some of our property crime issues that I mentioned, um, auto theft uh, to date, 28 less auto thefts are down 25.5 uh, percent. 35 less larcenies down 9.7 percent uh, and 17 less burglaries down 29.8 percent. Um, overall, uh, part one crime, when we look at it being down 16 percent or 111 crimes, um, that's a significant number. But if you look back three years ago, uh, we're down 34.2 percent for the first month and a half of the year from three years ago. That's 286 part one crimes less uh, this year than we were three years ago. Um, and then four years ago, we're about 292 uh, crimes less or 34% uh, down. Uh, the other significant thing that we trend is a 28 day period over 28 day period. We compare the last, this past 28 day period to the 28 day period before that. Um, our previous 28 days from this one, we're down 23.7% or 84 part one crimes. So as I said, you know, we're, uh, we are definitely uh, trending in the right direction. And now uh, the next item up on the agenda will uh, actually not the next item up on the agenda, but the, the following one. What, what I'll have to do is Captain Powell will go into the individual, the individual sections of the city and we'll, we'll really dive into those, uh, those numbers a little bit more specifically. But prior to that, this is the first public comm stat uh, since, uh, since Assistant Chief uh, Howell has come on board. Um, so I just want to publicly, he's been, uh, he's been out there in the community as much as he can. Uh, he's done a couple coffees with the chief uh, virtually. Uh, he's jumped on a, a few of the, the Zoom meetings with me and met, and met a bunch of people. Uh, but this being the first public comm stat, uh, I just wanted to give him an opportunity for to introduce himself quick and uh, and so people can see his face. So AC Howell, if you want to go ahead. Thank you, Chief. Uh, welcome everyone to ComStat, uh, our public comm stat. You're muted, Chief. Now? How about now? You can hear me? Okay, great. Oh, thank you. Second technical difficulty. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for uh, coming to the uh, public ComStat this year. Um, I'm new to the uh, police department. I'm the newest member. Um, I'm glad to be here. Um, just quickly about myself, I have 24 years of police experience. Uh, I uh, retired from New Haven as a police lieutenant uh, with 21 years and uh, went up to Massachusetts and became a chief up there for about three years. And now I'm here and I'm very uh, uh, proud to be here and thankful uh, to serve such a wonderful department as the city of Hartford and uh, its community. So uh, 
Thank you, and I look forward to meeting uh, all of you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chief Howell. Um, I uh, unfortunately second technology glitch. Uh, I couldn't hear him. I'm glad to see everybody else could. You'll have to tell me what he said later. <laughs> For some reason, my computer doesn't want to uh, tell me what he said. But um, so next up uh, is Captain Powell, our North District Commander, to give uh, an overview. Uh, Captain. Powell is in charge of our, our North District and, and Captain Laureano is in charge of our South District, but Captain Laureano is, is out uh, right now, not at work. So um, Captain Powell is gonna cover uh, both North and South for us. So I will turn it over to you and I hope that I can hear you. Okay, good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Uh, I just wanna point out that I'm, I'm not sure if the chief did that on purpose, but Howell and Powell sound very similar and they put us back to back. So I thought that was kind of amusing, but uh, I'm Captain Ian Powell, uh, like the chief uh, uh, just spoke to. I, I'm uh, overseeing the North Community Service Bureau. Um, just a brief highlight on what the Community Service Bureau's responsibility is. Um, our objectives are to engage with the community, uh, build, maintain, and enhance our relationships. Um, you know, we have community service officers and supervisors who attend community meetings and different events throughout the city. Um, to discuss you know, public safety concerns and you know, listen to the community's concerns. Um, and, and they act as liaisons uh, to these community groups and the police department in the city to be problem solvers and um, you know, work to en enhance the quality of life in these neighborhoods. Uh, we also have walk beats that are assigned uh, throughout both the North and South District uh, who assist in that process as well. Um, the districts, north and south, uh, the police department separates those into four separate districts, northeast, northwest, southeast, and southwest. Um, and each of those districts falls under uh, a lieutenant's responsibility to manage. Uh, some of the things that our people uh, address in the community, as the chief highlighted earlier, uh, this past year in particular, were, were pop-up parties, you know, late night street parties uh, that impacted the community and, and large gatherings at businesses uh, at that point that were, um, you know, impacting the quality of life in the neighborhoods. Uh, they worked to mitigate uh, the tremendous increase in fireworks, handle various protests throughout the city uh, with other divisions within the agency. Uh, they worked on addressing ongoing noise complaints, uh, they cover COVID testing sites and vaccination sites, uh, working long hours to re reduce uh, increases in violent crime. I mean, the list goes on. These, these people are here. Uh, they're dedicated. They're here every day um, in the community uh, trying to improve it. It is hard uh, when all, all of our meetings are virtual, but, um, you know, hopefully at some point we'll be looking to get back to in-person gatherings. Hopefully once the summer comes around, we can start interacting a little more. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, the Northwest District, Lieutenant O'Shea. Uh, part of their responsibilities in the districts is to um, manage the Part 1 crimes that the Chief mentioned uh, before and come up with uh, um, strategic ways to deal with crime trends. So I'm going to pass the, the torch on to Lieutenant O'Shea of the Northwest District. Uh, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, I'm commander in Northwest District. My name is uh, Lieutenant Rebecca O'Shea. Um, I became commander back in June. So uh, this is a new position for me. Um, and we have uh, three CSOs assigned to our division. They do an excellent job. We participate in many of the NRZ meetings as uh, well as numerous community events. Uh, for this week, we only had eight part one crimes uh, for Northwest. Uh, there were zero homicides, zero rapes, zero robberies. We're actually down in that category from last year, 28.6%. We had uh, zero serious assaults. We did have one burglary um, that was copper piping taken from a vacant building. Um, as far as the burglaries, we're down actually 50%. Um, change from last year. Larcenies, we had six for the week. Um, we are down 25.8% in 
uh, change from last year in larcenies. One was a shoplifting incident. There are no suspects on that. One incident involved uh, valuables being taken from a vehicle. There were no suspects on that. And three incidents involved stolen license plates. And two incidents involved Cadillac converters being taken. There's no suspects in that. Um, the Cadillac converters are something new that we're seeing a trend in. Uh, they are taking these Cadillac converters for the precious metals and uh, bringing them to scrap yards and selling them off. This is not um, something that's just unique to Hartford. It's occurring all over uh, the state. Um, I would say in Hartford, we've actually seen less compared to other cities and towns. Um, from what I'm, what I'm seeing, uh, auto thefts were down 30% from last year. Um, and uh, the one auto theft incident we had this week was actually domestic related. So there will be a warrant pending for that. Uh, shooting incidents were down 50%, um, which is great. Uh, as far as our arrests for the week, uh, or for the year, excuse me, uh, we've made a total of three gun arrests. Uh, a lot of those were made by CSOs um, and members of the CSB unit. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago over on Townley Drive, they had a uh, firearms arrest as well as a narcotics arrest and $3,500 seized. Um, an excellent job by officers Dorsey, Spencer, and Sikowski. Um, we also had numerous stolen vehicle arrests uh, by the CSOs. Last, uh, last week we had two, um, excellent job by them. Uh, I can't say enough about all the detectives, patrol officers, and uh, the community services officers in, uh, in the city. They do a phenomenal job and they help keep these numbers down. Um, the auto theft unit has uh, been out numerous times, conducted operations, uh, keeping those numbers down for us. In combination with patrol and CSB, uh, we're really making some headway in that area. Um, I hope we continue to do that for the future. And um, that's all I have, Captain. Thank you, uh, Lieutenant O'Shea. Uh, we're gonna move on to the Northeast District, Lieutenant Ruiz. Good evening, everybody. My name is Lieutenant Louis Ruiz. I'm in charge of Northeast District. I have four CSOs and uh, four walkbeat officers. So the walkbeat officers cover Albany Avenue and Barber Street. They're always they usually work Tuesday to Saturday in the evening hours. For the Northeast, uh, for statistic wise, we have uh, we're down 100% sexual assaults. Robberies for the year are down 31.3%. Assaults are down 27.3%. Burglaries are down 71%. Auto thefts are down 3.6%. And larceny is there. They've trickled up 8.8% for the year. They're up this year. When it comes to the Northeast, uh, biggest trend right now is larcenies. Right now, like I said before, we're 8.8 majority uh, up from last year. The majority of, car, of larcenies are car breaks. And we've asked our residents, the CSOs and walkers actually uh, asked our residents, residents not to leave any valuables in plain view in their vehicles. That seems to be the major issue. Residents leave TVs, phones, flat, and uh, elder electronics in plain view. And uh, these suspects come over there, they break the windows, and they take the, take the items, easy grab for them. We've uh, laid out flyers at uh, businesses to uh, to educate the public to secure the car doors and raise windows, and also we issued fake parking tickets to catch the owners of the vehicles' attention. If an officer sees like something in plain view, like a wallet uh, open, he'll check off the boxes wallet and put it under the, the vehicle windshield to hopefully grab the owners' attention to bring in the valuables in, into the into the house to leave it in the car. So that's one of our issues in the in the northeast is our large cities. Another issue is stolen vehicles. Last year we had a, a huge spike in stolen vehicles. This year we're down a little bit, but the major issue with stolen vehicles are people are leaving them running when they uh, visit the local business. Most of them are on Albany Avenue, Upper Main Street. They go out there, leave the car running, when they come back out, it's gone. It's an easy grab for an uh, auto theft suspect just to grab and take off with it. We saw the start, started to spread the words to the residents not to leave the vehicles unattended while, while shopping, and also lock the doors and take the key fob with them as well. A lot of, a lot of the guys take the cars by uh, jumping in the car while the doors are unlocked. 
and the fobs, the car still reads a fob with the, well, the owners in the store and these pushes the go button and take off it. So it's another thing. We're asking the residents to not to leave the keys of the car, you take the fob with them and lock the door behind them. As for arrest, uh, the upper Albany walkway officer made a robbery arrest last week. Uh, individuals trying to rob the gas station on Homestead and Woodland. Great job of the walkway officer patrol officer. Happened to be right then the perfect time to grab the guy. So nice arrest by uh, the walkway officers. And as well, the CSO in Albany Avenue walkway is always trying to uh, help out with the quality of life violation in the Albany Avenue. They've got numerous uh, summons and arrests for quality of life violations as well. So, and another thing, the upper Albany officers have been doing have uh, investigating uh, property damage. We've had a lot of quite a few property damage to the uh, new light poles and benches that have been part of the upper Albany revitalization zone. So they began to uh, investigate cases and follow up on leads and issue uh, offenders summonses or make a uh, draft arrest warrants. And we got to thank the Upper Albany uh, Association for helping us out with that as well. They've given us information in relation to the investigation. So that's been a great resource and a great partnership with them as well. So another thing that CSO is doing as a part of the food share program this past summer on the Barber and Edgar Street. We plan to do the same thing this summer as well. So they're gonna look out for, we're gonna usually get our flyers out as well. So um, they'll be out there doing that. And we do have a community event this coming Saturday. The Know Thy Neighbor is sponsoring a free community PPE distribution and COVID testing for hundred residents out of the, the Global Communication Academy this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Some of you might remember the old uh, Global Communications, formerly known as the Old Quirk Middle School. So feel free to go over and grab some uh, PPE uh, uh, gear that uh, know that anyone's given out. So that's a great program right there. We are gonna have future community events this, uh, this year, hopefully with uh, down spike with COVID, we'll be able to engage more of the community out there in the streets and uh, in the neighbors this coming summer, hopefully. And as a reminder, the Parker Moore is currently doing vaccines at uh, at the facility, just go over to trinityhealthof1.org to sign up to see you eligible. So, to spread the word out to the people in the community in regards to that as well. So, that is all I have for you guys right now. All right, great. Thank you, Lieutenant Ruiz. Uh, we'll move on to the Southeast District, Lieutenant Reynolds. Good evening, everyone. I assume you can hear me. All right. My name is Mike Reynolds. I'm in charge of the Southeast District. I'm currently a lieutenant. Uh, Southeast District, for everybody else that's listening out there, uh, comprises of downtown Barry Square, the South End, Sheldon and Charter Oak, and the South Meadows. Uh, this week, we had a total of 15 Part 1 crimes for the week with two Part 1 arrests. We'll go over uh, Part 1 crimes. Um, overall, the Southeast District is down 12.6% year to date. We're down 15.7% over the previous four years, and we're down 7.7% over the previous 28 days. Uh, for homicides, we had none this week. Um, sexual assault, we had one. We're down 75% overall. Robberies are down 25%. We had one this week. Assaults are down 18.5%. We had six this week. We'll cover some of those. Burglaries are down 9.5%. We had none this week. Larcenies are down 11%. We had five this week. Auto thefts are still trickling down. We had 3.4%. We had three this week. Our shooting instances are overall down from last year, uh, down 37.5% uh, for that. The sexual assault patrol responded to um, Harford Hospital. It was referred to SID, and I'll let Lieutenant Zarger field that one. Um, I don't want to give out too much information. Uh, for aggravated assaults, um, we had six. Uh, first one on Warner Street was uh, domestic violence. It resulted in dual arrests. 915 Main Street, we had victims struck by a BB gun. Um, we have a suspect uh, identified as a dark, dark infinity vehicle. It was last seen north on Main. Uh, 464 Wethersfield, we had a home invasion. It was kicked in. Uh, the back door was kicked in. Um, there was a uh, a shooting involved in that, and I'll let um, Major Crimes cover that one. Uh, the story got a little uh, uh, convoluted after that. Simple assault on Barker Street, another domestic violence on Mountford Street, and then we also had an assault on a police officer at uh, the station um, in which an intoxicated suspect spit in an officer's face while in detention. Larcenies are down 11%. Um, we had uh, a rash of catalytic converters stolen. We did have one catalytic converter arrest. We arrested Tran Fong. 
of 30th Street. He was charged uh, with uh, larceny and criminal mischief. They caught him uh, trying to cut out catalytic converters uh, with a sawzall out of vehicles. This was his second arrest in the last two weeks. He was last arrested on the 10th for the same thing. Um, I believe now he's still in custody. Auto thefts, again, like Lieutenant Ruiz said, majority of them are vehicles left running, either trying to warm them up uh, with the fobs in it. Good news, uh, we responded to one shooting at 151 Meadow Street, the Pearl Club. They continued to operate as a, as a nightclub despite the, uh, the pandemic. Um, CSO has issued uh, a cease and desist order to that to shut that place down. Um, despite the shooting, there are still people in there partying. Uh, we also had a good arrest of a shot off shotgun um, uh, at the Elscarpa restaurant. So it was a good job by everyone. Now. That's all I have. Lieutenant Ruiz covered a lot of it. Um, CSOs are out there uh, meeting with the community uh, and engaging them, We're trying to do the same things. Uh, obviously, the pandemic is, uh, is uh, taking a hit with some of it. So a lot of it's virtual now. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, uh, Lieutenant Reynolds. And finally, from the districts, we'll move to uh, Lieutenant Creter from the Southwest District. Thank you, Captain. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, good evening. I'm Lieutenant Creter, Southwest District Commander. Southwest District is made up of uh, South Green, Frog Hollow, Parkville, Behind the Rocks, and the Southwest. Um, here to date, our part one crimes are 167, which is down 22% from last year. Uh, we're down 78% in robberies, 8% in aggravated assaults, 12% in burglaries, 10% in larcenies, and over 60% in auto thefts. Um, crime patterns that we were seeing were uh, burglary specifically recently in the Frog Hollow and Behind the Rocks area. Uh, there is numerous burglaries that all fit the same MO, person breaking in. However, just this week, uh, Community Service Officer Pino of the Frog Hollow District identified from a uh, wanted flyer a suspect. Brought him, uh, he was arrested on a warrant, brought in, and major crimes detectives interviewed him. He's now confessed to seven of the burglaries in the area. Um, so that was a good job by Officer Pino. Um, larcenies are the driving force in my uh, part one crimes with 11 last week. Like I said, they're down 10%, but still that's my uh, biggest item. And I too have experienced catalytic, catalytic converter uh, thefts in my area, uh, CSO, Podzik from the Southwest District followed up on some of those. He obtained video evidence of one of the thefts that was actually a multiple theft where they returned multiple times. And we just put out a suspect flyer for a uh, vehicle that we're looking for to identify the operator of that. Um, other than that, uh, Southwest District officers responded to a uh, person uh, brandishing a firearm at Broad in New Britain last week. Uh, they located a suspect nearby. Uh, he appeared to be intoxicated. Uh, they attempted to take him into custody. There was a brief struggle, but he was found in possession of a firearm. He was a convicted felon and charged accordingly. Um, and that's uh, pretty much it. We've got uh, from last week, no victims of gunfire and our shooting incidents for the year are down 14.3%. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, LTs. If I can just quickly, I don't know if everybody can, if it's the videos on me or not, but I was just gonna show something Lieutenant Ruiz highlighted um, when it came to the larcenies from vehicles. This was a, a citywide effort from the police department to put out these, the fake tickets he referred to. Um, so if you do find one on, these, uh, on your car, it's because the officer checked off a box, saw something in the car that shouldn't be there, and thought they should let you know that you you, uh, you may be at risk, and uh, it may be a good time to try and take those items and conceal them in your trunk or take them out of the car. So, other than that, uh, that's all I have. Uh, I'll turn the mic back over to Chief Doty. Thanks, Captain Powell. Um, just prior to, we'll move on to um, the next item on the agenda. I just want to identify a couple of guests uh, as uh, that are in our, our virtual audience that are partners of ours that help us throughout the year. Jeremy Stein, the executive director of 
uh, Connecticut Against Gun Violence is with us, and uh, Glendra Lewis, our project coordinator for Hartford Project Longevity, is is also with us. So, just wanted to acknowledge that they are that they are here in the uh, in the virtual audience because I don't think that everyone can see that. So. Um, with that said, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Rodriguez Velez, our uh, career development commander, and she will go over uh, some recruitment uh, and, and PAL updates. Thank you, Chief. Can everyone hear me? Okay, awesome. As uh, the Chief said, I'm Lieutenant Marisol Rodriguez Velez, and I'm the commander for career development. Um, and under that, um, under my command falls obviously recruitment, retention, our cadet program, our PAL program and our EXPLORE program. Um, I have a team of four, two of which are sergeants and two officers. And I'll start off with the most recent graduate uh, graduates that we had this past December that are currently on FTO or on the job training. A total of 15 graduated from the academy and the demographics are as follows. We had 10 males, and, the, and that breakdown is eight white males and two black males. We have five females, two of which are white and three are Hispanic. And I'd like to point out that uh, two of those uh, recent graduates are cadets. Currently in the background process, we have a total of 72 candidates. Uh, and that breakdown is 57 males, 33 of which are white, 12 are black, 10 Hispanics, and two Asians. 15 are females, and that breakdown is uh, six white females, three black, and six Hispanic females. Of the uh, 72 that are currently in the background process, four are Hartford residents, two of which are cadets. Uh, and that particular breakdown for the uh, Hartford residents is one black male, uh, one Hispanic male, and one white male, along with one black female. Our current recruitment efforts, obviously, just like everyone else, are is limited due to COVID. But we uh, we continue to uh, have a strong presence in social media and all our social media outlets, specifically. Uh, with Instagram, our Instagram page, and our live info information sessions. Uh, we periodically do meet and greets with uh, other sworn offices within the department. We are attending all community meetings and events that are being held virtually. I uh, just want to share that we expect to have the next entry level police officer application available this April and the next application to hire approximately six cadets will be the end of March. That's all I have at the moment. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant. Uh, next on the agenda, Captain Coates, who is our headquarters commander and special teams commander. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Captain Mike Coates, I oversee headquarters, which also includes our patrol division, traffic division, special events as well. I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Kevin O'Brien. He's our traffic commander. He's actually out right now, I believe, on Weathersfield Avenue on a, on a DUI checkpoint. So go ahead, Kevin. Thank you, Captain. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Kevin O'Brien. I'm the commander of the traffic division. We're currently out at 620 Weathersfield Avenue at our OUI checkpoint. Uh, I'll just do some stats as of February 20th, 2021. Uh, the department as a whole has made 1,251 traffic stops with 833 coming from the traffic division, um, included 547 infractions with 85 of them, 85% core moving violations such as speeding, distracted driving, stop sign, uh, control signal. So the department really focuses on those core moving violations for infractions and uh, our percentage is very low for infractions for uh, equipment violations. Uh, throughout the year uh, with COVID and the pandemic and other issues, we've been working with the districts to assist uh, in the protest. We've helped the North District with the food shares as well as the South District. Um, We've also coordinated a lot of the vaccination and testing centers throughout the city with uh, the city of Hartford Health and Human Services, as well as Charter Oak Health. 
since January, uh, the January 1st, 2021, uh, the traffic division has staffed six testing centers, COVID testing centers, and five vaccination centers all around the city to include Dunkin' Donuts Park, uh, Weaver High School, 3580 Main, Goodwin Park. So a lot of these are mobile testing centers and vaccination centers uh, in an attempt to you know, reach out to everyone in the city, whether they have rides or not, to have the opportunity to get tested or vaccinated. Um, we've also coordinated in the districts cover Hartford Hospital, St. Francis and the Convention Center. So as a whole, the department um, has done a great job assisting with COVID uh, testing and vaccinations throughout the city of Hartford. We also help out the patrol division by responding to uh, traffic accidents. So as of February 20th, we have 117. So that allows the patrol officers to be freed up for uh, additional calls for service and not to be tried up, tied up on the traffic accidents. So we help out with that. Um, we also respond to 311 complaints of traffic uh, complaints. Uh, the NRZs make complaints to the CSOs and the district lieutenants. So we assist uh, helping out with those traffic complaints as well as we're part of the Vision Zero project, uh, which has goals of minimizing uh, pedestrian and vehicular fatalities throughout the city through engineering, studying accidents. So that's kind of in its uh, preliminary stages, but they are working on a Vision Zero project in the city of Hartford. Um, and then real quick, Chief Sody asked if I wanted to show um, the DUI checkpoints. So just give me a second here, switch it up. So currently we're at 620 Weathersfield Avenue. Um, the officers right now are actually in the process over there of conducting a few field sobriety tests on an individual who is operating uh, his vehicle through the stop. And at this time we've made um, three, issued three uh, arrests for individuals operating under the influence of alcohol or drugs. That um, It started at 5 p.m., so in about an hour and a half They've issued three summonses and they're doing one test south of the bat, which is blood alcohol testing truck. And they're also testing another individual here north of the bat as well. Um, so they're out here trying to keep the roadway safe. And we focus on the areas where we see uh, more crashes, serious crashes and fatalities in hopes of lowering the amount of uh, individuals who pass away and motor vehicle accidents. Um, so far this year, the traffic division has made 61 arrests for operating under the influence, not including any of the arrests tonight, as well as we have another checkpoint tomorrow night in area 100 Barber Street and Rovers on Saturday night. I think that's all I have, unless someone has questions. Thank you, Lieutenant. Yeah, our traffic division takes impaired driving very seriously year in and year out. They lead the state in uh, total DUI arrests. Um, General Brian's very proud of that, obviously, and, and they do a fantastic job in this city <clears throat> trying to keep the streets safe. I'm going to turn it over to Lieutenant Martin Cunningham. He uh, is in charge of our special events division. Good evening, everyone. As uh, the captain said, Lieutenant Martin Cunningham, I'm in charge of special events. What that entails is scheduling, planning, staffing, and permitting events uh, throughout the city. Obviously, with COVID, the last year has been a little bit tough. Um, not, not so much work for me, which is not a good thing for me or anyone else, but we have some uh, light uh, around the the end of the corner here. Um, baseball is going to be back, as I'm sure you are aware. First home game, May 11th, all the way through September for the Yard Goats capacity is limited to start, but hopefully with some changes, uh, according to uh, our, our best guess, we'll, we'll be having maybe 25% to start, maybe 50, but hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll get back to a, a more normal and full stadium, which is what we want here. Uh, we also have the Hartford Athletic Soccer. That's going to start around the 1st of May. They kind of have a flexible schedule this year, depending on their needs uh, of the league. Uh, but they are intending to play 32 home, 32 games overall. That's 16 home games, and they go from roughly May 1st into October. They are planning to uh, play. And uh, last year, that was the first league in the country to play the uh, the league that the Athletic are in. 
uh, pretty stringent requirements. They were able to do it last year. So we're looking forward to a, another year of soccer in Hartford, which is great news. Uh, we also have a lot of concerts in Hartford traditionally down at the Xfinity at the Meadows. Um, we're looking maybe July. Uh, there's stuff planned at, at, for now, but we will see if they, if they go off or not, but they're tentatively scheduled. So that's the positive. Um, the XL Center as well, the Wolfpack are playing. There's no fans yet, but the intent is to have uh, some folks by the end of the season in the uh, arena. And I know we're seeing that New Jersey and New York is having limited attendance already starting for, uh, for games uh, for the NBA. And so hopefully the NHL and uh, the AHL for us here will be uh, soon have some people inside the building. Um, as I said, with, with the COVID, per, the permitted events have been down, but we are seeing some, uh, some stuff coming through the city and uh, people are going to planning events. So that's kind of a positive looking into June and uh, August specifically, we've had some uh, tentative plans already. So that's a positive. And looking even farther ahead into October, the Hartford Marathon Foundation is planning on having the marathon this year. I know it was canceled last year, but it is planned this year to go off maybe smaller scale, but they are anticipating having a marathon of some type, not a virtual one, an actual marathon with people running, which is great for us. It's probably the biggest one day event we have uh, for a department. So that's a really great thing to hear. Um, and also I, I kind of dabble with the bikes, with our bike unit uh, for Captain Coates and the, and the chief have, have made it in a, a great effort and they've put the resources towards uh, bringing bikes back out for the police officers. I know that the public likes seeing the officers on bicycles and the officers like being on bicycles, kind of humanizes the officers. And, uh, and uh, when we can get back out there in the spring, you'll probably see some new bicycles and some nice new uniforms on people. And that's a credit to the chief and Captain Coates who've kind of spearheaded that. And uh, that's all I really have uh, for everyone right now. Thanks, Lieutenant. Turn it back over to you, Chief. Uh, thanks, Captain Coates. So just a couple things, uh, Lieutenant Cunningham, you know, special events was something that uh, that wasn't a real busy year for him this year. Um, uh, you know, he's he was uh, he took that role over in the in the in the spring and was ready to go. And and we didn't really have a lot of special events. So just public credit to him. Uh, he's one of those these folks that um, reached out and found things to do. So he a lot of the things like uh, making sure that our bike unit was up and running, making sure that the bikes were uh, were, were fixed and were were greased up and ready to go. Buying new bikes um, is not something that that uh, that was usually his job, but he stepped up to the plate and did that. Uh, he also helped out uh, with our with a property room issue uh, and some other things. So uh, kudos to Lieutenant Cunningham for not just sitting by uh, on the sidelines and uh, and watching COVID go by. Instead, he stepped up to the plate and helped the department out in many other ways, including some of our COVID efforts. Um, and just real quick, um, so uh, Lieutenant O'Brien touched on it. We kind of kicked this off, uh, I think, prior to COVID. So some people may be aware of it, but um, Lieutenant O'Brien referenced the traffic crash officers. Uh, so what we've tried to do is, is is take some of the more complex things that our patrol division officers uh, respond to and create some specialized officers to respond to those, those incidents. So traffic crash, uh, they redid the form of uh, probably quite a few years back now um, from a, a relatively simple form to a massive uh, undertaking. And it was having our patrol officers go out to these crashes and then have to sit behind a computer um, they were not able to be done uh, it, manually or, or in the cars. So they have to come back into the station or one of the substations to sit behind a computer for hours on end doing these reports. Um, some of these uh, car accidents are, involve evading motor vehicles and require a follow-up. Uh, it's tough on a patrol officer that's answering calls for service every day as they come in in 911 to do adequate follow-ups. Um, so it, it, it it increased the frustration for the community because they're trying to get these accident reports complete, accurate, thorough um, for insurance purposes and other purposes. And it was just, it was a disaster. Um, so we dedicated, uh, originally we dedicated four officers to these crash units so they can go out and they can take these calls for service. We did that with domestic violence response as well for some of the same reasons, but also different reasons. Um, you know, domestic violence is, is a real serious problem, uh, not, not just here, but everywhere. 
uh, and we wanted to put dedicated resources if we could answering those calls. We work very closely with Interval House. We have social workers embedded in the police department. We have a detective that's assigned to following up on domestic violence uh, incidents. Uh, but uh, the first line response, we wanted to be a specific response. Um, for some of the same reasons as crash, uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved, lethality assessments, domestic violence forms on arrests. Um, there's, there are specific rules that we follow uh, uh, regarding domestic violence. The policy for that is about 36 pages long. Um, so some of the reasons we made these specialized units are so that we could get uh, better, more specific training in these, issue, in these areas for the officers, um, have better follow-up by the officers, um, end up with a more thorough investigation and a better product. Um, and it also works as like a, a stepping stone, something for officers, you know, in, in an era where we're trying to retain our officers here, you know, we do like many other police departments have problems with young officers leaving uh, for other career paths or for other departments. So this was an opportunity to let some of our officers step out of that day-to-day -day answering calls for service and, and get a little bit more specialized. And this also can be used for them to step up into a more specialized unit someday, whether it be a detective division position in, in domestic violence, or whether it be you know, a full-time traffic officer or an accident reconstructionist someday in our crime scene division, which we'll hear from later. Um, so I, I just, in, in addition to all of those things, this also frees up our patrol officers to answer calls for service in a more timely manner. We're trying to reduce our, um, our response times. So when people are calling us for, uh, you know, for issues in the community, we can get there quicker. And we don't have four or five officers, which on a, on a busy rush hour day, we could easily have four or five officers sitting in, um, in the police department submitting uh, or, or finishing up on those reports or following up on a domestic violence. So a um, little difficult to, to assess its, its, uh, its outcomes just yet. Um, Captain Coates is, is putting some of that information together. Um, obviously, it's difficult to assess everything during a world of COVID, but um, we're, we're hoping to figure out just how big of an impact. We know we're having an impact by having these specialized teams, um, but we want to see just how big of an impact. Uh, you know, that little field trip, I will give credit also to Captain Coates. That was his idea. Um, and, and it was kind of cool. Uh, we got to get uh, Lieutenant O'Brien to hold the camera a little bit steadier next time so we all don't vomit on this thing. Um, but, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of this virtual world is we might be able to bring you into the seat of a cruiser a little more often than we did before. And even when we do in-person ComStat, we're going to try to find unique ways of using this technology to show folks out there, uh, how the police department operates in a, in kind of a real time fashion. We keep our fingers crossed that nothing crazy happens live. Um, but uh, but thank you, Lieutenant O'Brien, for doing that. We'll get you a tripod or something next time. Um, next, Captain Russo, who is our captain in charge of our investigative services bureau, so all of our detective divisions. Go ahead, Captain. Thank you, Chief. Good evening. Uh, as the Chief said, my name is Jeff Russo. I'm the captain who oversees the Investigative Services Bureau, which is our detective bureau. Uh, we have an operational side, which includes the Vice Intelligence Narcotics Division. Under Intel, uh, we have our C4, which is our Capital City Command Center. Um, they work off-site, our operational division. And the, on, on the investigative side, we have our Major Crimes Division, Special, Investigation, Special Investigations Division and Crime Scene Division, and they all work out of here at the headquarters at 253 High Street. Uh, the last year, as many other speakers have mentioned, certainly has been challenging for law enforcement, the Hartford PD, the city, the community, and also our Detective Bureau. Um, the commitment and dedication of members of our Detective Bureau has been nothing short of amazing. Uh, lots of long hours, sleepless nights, um, our Vice Intelligence Narcotics Division put themselves in harm's way every day, dealing with the most violent offenders, our Major Crimes Division, Special Investigations Division, and Crime Scene Division have worked hard to bring justice to our families uh, who have been victimized. I'm very proud of the, uh, the hard work and commitment to the uh, mission. Uh, these guys go out there every day and they work hard and they uh, very rarely ask for vacation or days off. If anything, they just want to come here and work more after being here 40 hours a week. Some will work 60, 70, 80 hours, whatever it takes to help reduce the crime and, and help the community. So um, they definitely make me look good. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about, uh, switching gears here, is our non-fatal shooting team that we're creating uh, that should be up and running here soon. 
It's going to be working out of our major crimes division. So if I could just speak briefly on that. Uh, like most big cities across the country, Hartford in 2020 experienced an increase in shootings. In response to the increase in gun violence, the Hartford Police Department will be inserting additional investigative resources uh, to the major crimes division. Now, of course, every shooting is investigated. Our homicide detectives solved 76% of the homicides in 2020. That's way above the national average, which is uh, right around uh, 62%. Uh, these additional resources will form a specialized team that will bolster our efforts in helping solve non-fatal shooting crimes. This new non-fatal shooting team will be focused on shooting incidents in which victims are struck by gunfire, but survive their injuries. There will be an emphasis to solve cases at a higher rate and do it in a more rapid manner. If we can solve more of these cases and make arrests faster than before, we will be able to prevent some of the retaliatory and also back and forth shootings that tends to lead to additional violence. Solving non-fatal shootings, solving a non-fatal shooting in June, for instance, with an arrest may just prevent that retaliatory homicide from occurring in July. Having a non-fatal shooting team that moves quickly to hold the shooters accountable also will send a strong message to the groups that are responsible for violence in the city. They may think twice about escalating the violence knowing that their buddies are getting locked up and put in jail. Right now, as we form a team, we are working with our law enforcement colleagues in Denver, Colorado, who have displayed great success with their non-fatal shooting team. We are also working with researchers and looking at data to determine the best way to deploy the team we have received support from the state's attorney's office in Hartford. We're very thankful for that. And our non-fatal shooting team will also be working with our partners on the state and federal levels. Last week, we just selected our supervisor who will lead this team out of the major crimes division. Uh, Sergeant Michael Rykowski was, was selected. He comes to us from the patrol division. Prior to being promoted, he was a tenacious investigator when he was previously assigned to the division as a detective. Uh, his experience will be invaluable in leading this team. Uh, Sergeant Rykowski will report to the commander of the Major Crimes Division, Lieutenant Aaron Boisvert. Although not selected as of yet, the non-fatal shooting team will consist of a group of highly motivated detectives who have displayed great skill and abilities. They'll be asked to make significant sacrifices while serving as members of this team. We expect to be, them to be working long hours, including nights, weekends, holidays, in order to fill the objectives of the team and the department. I look forward to working with the Major Crimes Division and this newly created non-fatal shooting team. I appreciate the chief and his efforts and helping us form this team and his support as we move forward here. This team will definitely work to make a significant impact on the gun violence and provide the citizens of Hartford with uh, safe communities. Now I'd like to turn it over to the different divisions. Um, as I mentioned before, we have a Major Crimes Division, we have a Special Investigation Investigations Division, Vice Intelligent Narcotics Division, and a Crime Scene Division. We will uh, start first with the Major Crimes Division, and I will send it over to Lieutenant Aaron Boisvert. Thank you, Captain. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Lieutenant Boisvert, I'm currently assigned to the, the commander of the Major Crimes Division. Uh, I'll begin with homicides. We had zero for the week. We're currently at three homicides this year compared to four at this time last year, which is down 25%. We've made one arrest so far out of the three homicides this year, and we are very close to making an arrest on a second one. Uh, with the recent arrest for the Shoulders Place homicide back in December by Detectives DiMatteo and Logan, that brings the number of homicides cleared for 2020 to 19 out of 25 homicides. As the captain mentioned, that's a 76% clearance rate. We're currently waiting on lab results uh, confirmation on another homicide and expect that number to be 20, which will bring the percentage to 80%. So it's phenomenal work by our homicide detectives. A recent shootings for the week, we had one for the week, uh, Lieutenant Reynolds brought it up, uh, 464 Weatherstill Avenue. Um, all information indicates that this was certainly a targeted attack. Uh, it's currently under investigation by Detective Maldonado. Um, Detectives Parker and Logan did a great job in the investigation of the February 9th shooting at 450 Garden Street, where the victim was shot numerous times and was listed in critical condition. An arrest warrant was drafted and approved for 28-year-old Shaquille Brown, charging with assault first degree, criminal attempt to commit murder, and criminal possession of a firearm. Uh, he was picked up by the Hartford Police Fugitive Task Force yesterday, uh, taken into custody without incident. 
He's currently being held on a $1 million judge said fine. Great job by Detective Parker and Logan. Also, Detective Liz now just submitted an arrest warrant for the February 8th shooting at 24 Heath Street, which is currently awaiting judicial review. Detective Heselton made two firearms arrests in connection with the January 4th drive-by shooting at 454 Park Street. And he's also anticipating in multiple additional arrest warrants for that shooting. Currently, we're at 17 non-fatal shootings compared to 22 last year. That's down 75% for last week and down 26 from this time last year. We've currently made arrests in four of this year's shootings and the detectives continue to work hard on these cases. Serious assaults, the city saw 13 for the week. That's down 6% from last year. Eight of those assaults resulted in arrests or warrants from the patrol division. Three of those assaults involved a person being struck by a BB gun. And the BB gun incidents occurred at Hungerford and Capitol on the 14th, 915 Main Street on the 15th, and 1200 Park Street on the 16th. These cases have all been assigned to Detective Duarte, who has uh, located a suspect vehicle on our C4 camera sister, um, excuse me, system and has disseminated a flyer department-wide in attempt to identify the vehicle. It's believed to be a black infinity. There have been no further BB gun assaults since. We also picked up a stabbing that occurred in an unknown location after the victim arrived at Harvard Hospital on the 20th. That case is being investigated by Detective Pethigal. Robberies, the city saw two for the week, which is down 44% from last year. Uh, we at, here at MCD picked up one of them. And it was a shoplifting that turned into a robbery from the Family Dollar up on Main Street in the North End where an employee was pepper sprayed after he tried to stop a shoplifter. Detective Lizna has that case. Burglaries, we had three for the week, down 29% from last year. None of those have been assigned to MCD due to the passage of time and lack of investigative leads with those specific three. Uh, however, as Lieutenant Creeder brought up earlier, uh, we had a break this week, which will result in the arrest of a series of pattern burglaries. Yesterday, Officer Pino and his PPO located the suspect in these burglaries from a flyer distributed by Detective Flores and Cody. Uh, the suspect was identified in the burglaries that happened in the Trinity Market at 543 Zion Street on the 1st of January, uh, the same location on the 14th of January, the Select Food Mart at 181 Franklin Avenue on January 17th, Victoria's Pizza at 168 Hillside Avenue on January 19th, and the DB Mart at 125 New Britain Avenue on the 25th. And also, excuse me, the Dunkin' Donuts at 265 Washington Street on the February 6th. So the same individual has six burglaries that we have warrants coming down for. So it's a great job by those guys. And uh, last but not least, uh, our overdose deaths, we had three last week which brings us to a total of 13 for the year as compared to 14 at this time last year. That's what I have for MCD cap. Great, thanks, Lieutenant. Uh, solving 19 homicides, looks like it's gonna be 20 years sooner out of 25. I mean, that's, a, that's great work by the uh, detectives of major crimes. All right, moving on to the Special Investigations Division, Lieutenant Steven Zarger. Good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone that's uh, attending. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Steven Zarger. Um, I'm the commander of the Special Investigative Division. Um, currently, uh, things that we're targeting, we have uh, two human trafficking cases that we're working on with the FBI Human Trafficking Task Force, as well as uh, setting up future operations with them uh, to target anybody that's looking to um, do harm to our youth uh, in the confines of the city of Hartford and also reaching out to other agencies to uh, if there's a nexus that also spans outside of the city uh, limits. Um, for missing persons, so far for this year, we've uh, been assigned 50 cases. Of those, only 14 of them re remain open. Um, and we take those very serious with uh, trying to bring them all to uh, good closures. Um, and also the other thing that, uh, one of the other things my unit oversees is sex offenders um, in the city of Hartford. So currently we have a list of 612 sex offenders of those 571 of them are active. We have 41 of them that are incarcerated with the DOC. Of those 220 did Hartford offenses where 392 were non-Hartford offenses. And we have 452 that are compliant and 119 that are non-compliant. And as of this week, we applied for three warrants for ones that were non-compliant. Um, so the non-compliant ones, we um, work with the court systems but if the, uh, the numbers fluctuate a lot because if the person was non-compliant, but then becomes compliant again, while the warrant is being uh, drafted and submitted, 
Um, the courts normally won't sign off on those because the person is now currently uh, compliant. Any your questions, sir? No questions, thank you. Now moving on to the Vice Intelligence and Narcotics Division. We'll start off with Lieutenant Pia and then he'll be followed by Sergeant uh, Mastriani. So Lieutenant Anthony Pia. Good evening, can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you. Um, as the captain said, my name is Lieutenant Anthony Pia, currently the commander of the Vice Intelligence and Narcotics Division, also known as the VIN Division. Uh, under my command, we have the Violent Crime Unit, the Auto Theft Unit, uh, Fugitive Task Force, uh, and Narcotics as well. Um, the purpose of, of all the units here in this division is to focus on the violent offenders uh, in the attempts at reducing uh, violence on the city streets uh, and focusing our effort on the most violent, most dangerous subjects out there. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the numbers uh, of seizures so far for 2021 uh, from the VIN division. Uh, currently, uh, so far this year, uh, roughly 15,000 bags of heroin have been recovered from the street, uh, 1,500 grams of heroin raw, 230 grams of crack cocaine, over 1,000 grams of cocaine, uh, eight search warrants have been conducted, uh, and 11 firearms have been seized off the street. As you see here on the, on the screen, you should be seeing a picture of the 11 firearms that we recovered uh, so far for this year and some of the narcotic seizures. Uh, the goal here, obviously, is to remove these illegal weapons from the street before they're used in any kind of violent crime. Um, so far for 2021, um, I'm going to start out with some auto theft uh, information. We started out the year running, so to speak, no pun intended. On January 1st of this year, early in the morning, uh, our units uh, spotted a vehicle that was carjacked in Bloomfield, Connecticut. It was a violent, strong arm carjacking of an elderly woman. Uh, and for the first auto theft of the uh, rest of the year, uh, these uh, detectives and investigators were able to um, pursue these individuals on foot through Keeney Park uh, and captured them after a foot pursuit. Um, so far, auto theft arrest for the year, including tonight. Uh, they're currently uh, conducting an operation today. So far today, four recovered stolen motor vehicles and two arrests have been made, bringing the total of 17 auto theft arrests for 2021 with 21 unoccupied stolen vehicles recovered. Uh, continuing on the auto theft side to work with our courts uh, and the intelligence side of the house to identify the most prolific car thieves. Obviously we can make a million um, auto theft arrests, but as long as we're arresting the right people and preventing them from, from continuing this kind of behavior is the goal. Um, we're hoping for firm prosecution of these um, repeat offenders. Uh, as we know, a small portion of these offenders are responsible for the majority of the auto thefts. Um, currently, today, we have a Rocky Hill police officer that's assisting us, uh, who is here to kind of learn on how we do it uh, as the suburban towns around us are starting to understand that they are, um, well, not the police departments, but the, the auto theft problem is directly related to the suburban towns that surround us as the majority of our stolen vehicles recovered in the city are stolen from uh, surrounding towns. So uh, there is uh, some buy-in from area uh, police departments and they are assisting us uh, in learning uh, how we handle ourselves here. Uh, moving on to our violent crime unit. Uh, they're actively investigating numerous shots fired incidents uh, and they are working uh, all, sorry, all um, avenues to uh, identify individuals involved in violent crime. Uh, and they also work with our federal partners to adopt these cases on a federal level uh, when that time comes. Uh, so far this year, out of the Violent Crimes Unit, uh, just to, to highlight a couple of their uh, notable arrests, uh, they arrest an individual on Alden Street with a 40 caliber Glock with an extended magazine. Uh, that firearm was stolen out of Virginia and that individual had some firearm history as well. Uh, 286 Homestead Avenue, which is the buggy bath car wash. Uh, there was an arrest there of an individual who was in possession of a 45 caliber Taurus firearm, which was stolen at New Haven. Uh, that individual in particular had an extensive violent criminal history, uh, including being arrested for shooting at someone in 2015 and a shots fired incident in 2012. Um, I'm sorry, shooting at someone in 2012 and shooting someone in 2015. Uh, that individual was back out on the street uh, and subsequently arrested with that firearm. Uh, he was also on parole and his parole was subsequently violated. So just to give an example of how we're focusing on the violent uh, offenders. Um, 
continuing on to our fugitive task force, which was mentioned by a couple of the other lieutenants, that uh, they are absolutely um, wonderful at catching uh, these individuals when we need them to. Um, so far this year, uh, for 2021, the 15 warrants have already been served by our fugitive task force, uh, several for uh, shooting incidents, um, several for homicides. Um, uh, some of those occurred outside of Hartford, but uh, were captured in Hartford, uh, several sexual assaults, uh, and eight other uh, warrants that were related to violent uh, offenses. Uh, talk a little bit about our narcotics divisions, had a busy year so far. Um, just to run down a couple uh, locations. Again, the goal uh, is to focus our resources on areas that are seeing uh, violence, obviously continued violence or spikes in violence, uh, the attempt to gain information uh, as well as address these violent offenders. A uh, couple examples, um, search warrant was conducted on Kent Street, a substantial amount of fentanyl was recovered from there and a 22 caliber revolver. Uh, Clifford Street uh, with an assisted case with our federal partners, a 40 caliber Glock with a hundred round magazine, which um, might've seen in the picture there, uh, 13,000 bags of fentanyl, over a thousand grams of cocaine, marijuana, cutting agents. And uh, if you see in the back of that photo, there's a bulletproof vest there. Um, that suspect was also a suspect in other violent incidents in the city. Uh, and that case is being evaluated at the federal level. Uh, Franklin Avenue, um, a couple weeks ago, we assisted Yonkers, New York police uh, they had a murder suspect out of Yonkers. Uh, that was a drug-related murder. The suspect was uh, hiding in our city. Uh, it was collaborative effort between the U.S. Marshals, uh, FBI, uh, Yonkers Police Department, uh, and Hartford Police. Uh, inside uh, an apartment on Franklin Avenue, the suspect was located with some narcotics and as was arrested for the murder, as well as in possession of a 9 millimeter handgun that was used in the murder. Uh, Bedford Street, area. Uh, we did a couple uh, operations and search warrants there. Uh, many arrests, uh, large amounts of, of narcotics were recovered. Uh, and then just a couple other ones that I'd like to cover before I finish up. Congress Street, we conducted a uh, investigation there after a recent uh, homicide that had occurred over there. Uh, we identified uh, an individual involved in the illegal drug trade and was known to be violent. A uh, search warrant was conducted in the area, which resulted in over 200 grams of fentanyl, 400 pack, bags of packages fentanyl, and a 357 handgun. Uh, it should be noted that the suspect arrested in that incident uh, was also on parole for a murder that he committed in 1995 and was released from prison uh, only a few years ago. Again, he was another violent individual whose parole was remanded as well on top of our arrest. Uh, moving on to two uh, very recent uh, locations that have seen an increase in violence. Uh, 1994 Main Street was an operation that we conducted last week. Uh, the area in 1994 Main Street, we conducted an operation in that area targeting known violent offenders. Um, numerous arrests were made. Uh, uh, substantial amounts of narcotics were recovered in the area, but one in particular, an individual was spotted. Um, uh, it was known to the investigators as being involved in the violence and the illegal drug trade in the area. Uh, he was uh, subsequently arrested after a foot chase with a nine millimeter handgun. Uh, what's notable about this incident is that individual had been arrested in 2004 for a robbery first. In 2008 was charged with an illegal possession of a firearm and 2014 was charged with illegal possession of a firearm. This is now his third gun arrest. So. Um, Hopefully we can keep him off the street for a little while and not um, increasing the violence in that area. Uh, and then uh, the last thing I have on my list is an operation that we conducted uh, this week, uh, Weathersfield Avenue area. I know Weathersfield Avenue has been mentioned a few times. We've had some incidents there. Um, there was actually a twofold operation that we conducted. There was both a street operation and several search warrants. There was actually three search warrants that were uh, conducted in that area, again, targeting these violent individuals, which we mentioned that are involved in the illegal drug trade as well. During that operation, two handguns were recovered, a nine millimeter ghost gun, which is a firearm that basically has no trackable uh, serial number on it, uh, which had an extended magazine and a 22 caliber chorus firearm, which actually you'd see at the top right of your picture there where it says Weathersfield Avenue at Elliott. Um, one interesting thing about these cases is the two individuals who were arrested with these guns also have substantial history. Um, one individual was arrested with a gun in 2016 and two arrests uh, where he actually fired a firearm. Uh, the other individual, uh, it's a second firearm arrest and he had two previous robbery arrests. Uh, during the Weathersfield Avenue um, 
operation and search warrants. Subsequently, I mentioned the two handguns, but we also recovered two stolen motor vehicles, um, over 60 grams of fentanyl, which uh, is roughly 25, which would fill roughly 2,500 bags of fentanyl, uh, 180 grams of crack cocaine, and 993 packaged bags of fentanyl. Uh, these are just a few of many uh, positive things that uh, these investigators are doing on a daily basis to reduce, obviously, a gun violence and increase the safety of our streets while also addressing the illegal drug trade that is occurring. Um, that's all I have to present now, uh, Captain, unless uh, anyone has any questions for me currently. No, no questions, Lieutenant Pia. Thank you very much. Uh, great work by your team. Um, why don't we hand it off to uh, Sergeant Christopher Mastriani, which he will cover the Intelligence Division and the uh, C4, which is the Capital City Command Center. Good evening, everyone. I'm Sergeant Chris Mastriani. I'm supervisor of our intelligence unit, which includes our real-time crime center, or C4, as a lot of people know it. <clears throat> um, this, this division here is made up of, I have six sworn police officers, five civilian analysts. I have a Department of Corrections intel analyst, and I have an Army counter-narcotics analyst. So we have a pretty good mixture here of sworn civilian, uh, even Department of Corrections, and even the military here. Getting into uh, how we track our numbers. <clears throat> this is how I track our numbers here. Um, this is our year to date, 664 requests for service by our civilian analysts. These are basically requests that come in from the patrol division or any investigator um, looking for an assistance in video, cell phone extractions, uh, forensics, uh, social media lookups, anything like that. Um, so we track them here by offense, by category, um, by agency, by day a week. Uh, you name it. Last year, you can see in the upper right there, 2020, we hit almost 6,000 requests for service um, for 300 and something days. So it's a it's a busy little center here with, with our civilians. They do a great job. Uh, cameras, everyone always likes that. Uh, what I want to know about cameras, we're at about 883 camera locations with over 1,000 camera views. Uh, and then the other question everybody wants is where are they coming next? So here's kind of some future plans that, we, that I'm working on right now. Upper Weathersfield. Uh, looks a little confusing, but basically the green circles there is our our camera locations that we're working on right now. We're going pretty aggressive with Upper Weathersfield Ave. It's been a huge quality of life uh, issues there for years since I've been a cop here. Uh, so we're going pretty aggressive on that street, kind of like we did with Park Street. On the lower right there, you see Upper Albany Ave, which has been a weak spot for us um, for a while with cameras. There's some proposed locations there. Kent Street, Adams Street, Woodland Street, Edgewood Street. Um, and we already have Baltimore Street, Blue Hills Ave, Garden Center, and Vine. So Albany Ave, that's actually happening really quick. I already have the cameras for it. They're pulling fiber down the street as we speak. Um, so that's pretty exciting. There's, there's going to be a lot of uh, helpful coverage there. Uh, what do we do with these cameras? The next slide. Begin. Um, this is kind of what we do on a daily basis. Uh, we capture uh, vehicles. Every car in this slide here was part of shots fired calls um, that we've captured on video, whether license plates or no license plates, um, individuals. So this is something we're doing daily, weekly here uh, with these cameras, just catching violent criminal acts and creating tons of solvability around those acts with the hope that if we can create solvability, we can put the shooters in jail and we can drive down the shooting numbers in the city. So it's been really effective and, I, and I'm excited because it's gonna get even better. Another thing we did in here uh, 2020 is we uh, started some juvenile intelligence surrounded by students involved in violent crimes. There was kind of an uptick with violent crimes around the schools, whether on school grounds or in the schools. So we dedicated an officer in here, two officers to just look at students or juveniles involved in violent crimes only. We're not uh, just watching students or, or juveniles, but um, trying to create an intelligence around those that are involved in violent crimes, most notably guns. And it was kind of highlighted at the end of last year with this arrest here. Uh, there was a student at New Visions School at Greenfield Street who was bragging on the internet and posting videos of himself with a gun inside the school, walking down the hallways in the bathroom. Um, my officers intercepted that, acted on it. We had created a relationship with Hartford Public School Security. We were able to find out what school he was in. We walked into that school and took him out with a uh, loaded 45 1911 on him. Uh, so that was just a great uh, success story for them. Uh, they could have 
stop something really tragic from happening to us in a school. Um, something else we did here is we ran a, a bun, uh, gun buyback every year. A little bit more difficult this year with, with COVID, but we actually did hold one at the Willie Ware Center. Um, we had a smaller turnout than usual, but it was worth it because we actually got five assault weapons, fully automatic assault weapons in that buyback. You can see them in the picture there. There's actually three fully automatic assault rifles and then a, a fully automatic handgun there. So that was a really su good success. That was just citizens walking up off the street and handing us those guns. Um, essentially for not a ton of money, but they did get a gift card to stop and shop. Project Longevity is, a, is another program that we run out of the Intelligence Center. Um, for those of you who don't know, Project Longevity is, is a, an outreach program where we really get into the, try to get into the living rooms of some of these violent offenders in the city. We go to their house, we visit them with um, social services coordinators. We offer them help, uh, different opportunities, things they can do with their life. But with that offering is also a strong message of, hey, if you continue to engage in gun violence, you will be a target of law enforcement. Um, last year with the COVID, we were, had to cease kind of our in-home visits for a while, but we did end the year with 70 uh, in-home custom notifications, we call them. And the goal for 2021 is to do 10 a week, um, which we are doing right now very successfully. Um, other than that, on top of that, we did do a lot with the pop-up parties, uh, the protests. We had almost 200 protests in the city last year. Uh, we built a really good relationship with the court where we're sending them intelligence and some of these guys that are locked up with guns, like Lieutenant Pete was saying, if it's his third, fourth gun arrest, can we get some uh, deeper consideration from the courts? And one of the last things we do, which is actually a really popular one, is illegal dumping. Uh, we have a couple cameras that are dedicated just to illegal dumping. We move them around the city. Work with an officer in the city, Officer Tom Knapp, who that's what he—that's his main uh, assignment. Working hand in hand with him, I know he's put out a lot of illegal dumping summonses, and the court has actually ordered some restitution back to the city for the cost of the cleanup for that. Um, so that's about it. Uh, shot spotters and other things. Some people ask. We did add some uh, sensors throughout the city to improve our coverage. Um, some most recent cameras we added was Capitol and Broad, Broad and Russ. Weathersfield and Elliott, Maine and Windsor. And we have Hooster and Pavilion and Homestead and Sigourney coming uh, right around the corner. Um, so it's getting really exciting for me. I'm kind of nerd on it, but we have a lot of uh, additional cameras coming. The city's really helped us. The city's pushing high-speed internet, uh, Wi-Fi through the whole North End and South End. Um, they're starting with the North End now. So there's a lot of network capabilities out there for us uh, from a technology standpoint. That's it for me, Cap. We definitely utilize our technology resources to uh, prevent crime, solve crime, and, and try to help keep the communities as safe as possible. Thank you, Sergeant Mastriani. And next we have the uh, crime scene division. Our crime scene division is led by uh, Sergeant Jeremy Ball. Good evening, everybody. As the captain said, my name is uh, Jeremy Ball. I'm a supervisor here in the crime scene division. For those of you who aren't familiar with the crime scene division, we work in support of and in conjunction with the other detective divisions in the Investigative Services Bureau, as well as with the Community Services Bureau and in patrol. Um, my detective's duties include um, processing of major crime scenes, including photography, um, digital laser scanning, documentation, evidence collection, preservation, submission for an analysis, uh, DNA recovery, uh, latent print processing. It's about all the CSI stuff you kind of see on TV. We also do uh, processing of uh, recovered firearms, um, including um, uh, latent print processing, DNA processing, and uh, test firing for ballistic analysis, which is something we just started up with in the conjunction with uh, the state lab. Um, one of the major things that we do in the crime scene division is the investigation of fatal accidents. Um, last year, we had 17 fatal accidents, and um, of those, seven of the cases have been completely closed as of now. Eight of them will be closed. Uh, we're just waiting for supplemental materials, and we're gonna, we only have two open and active investigations for last year. I'm anticipating within the next couple months that 16 of the 17 accidents we investigated last year will be completely closed, either by arrest or by other circumstances. This year, so, so far for 2021, you have two fatal crashes with a total of three fatalities. Um, this is one crash higher than what we had last year and two fatalities higher than we had last year at this time. 
Uh, both of those crashes are still under active investigation and uh, things are coming along with both of them. Uh, one of them, there's going to definitely be arrests made and the second one is going is still under interview stage and I expect resolution on both of those um, very shortly from my detectives. Uh, my detectives are very highly trained. We're probably one of the most experienced um, divisions in the department as far as um, number of years and training that our guys have. I'm very proud of my guys. I have two detectives that are going for uh, training for NIBIN, which is the National Integrated Ballistic Information Network entry next week with the state lab and the ATF. With that, we'll enhance um, other divisions, including VIN and the uh, non-fatal shooting um, task force that was just set up as well. And that's all I got. Thank you. Thank you, Sergeant Ball. That concludes the uh, presentation for the Investigative Services Bureau. So I'll throw it back over to you, Chief. Great job, everybody. Thank you. So uh, next on the agenda, I will uh, invite our, our, our esteemed guests, uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Karen Peck and um, Christopher McKee. Can you hear me, Chief? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much. I just wanna introduce myself first. I'm Karen Peck. I am a, an assistant US attorney and have recently been designated as the chief of the Violent Crime and Narcotics Unit here at the US Attorney's Office. So I look forward to um, meeting uh, several of you and, and working closely with you to try to address uh, in particular the issues with violent crime and narcotics um, that are affecting the greater Hartford area. Um, I've had a lot of discussions uh, recently with the assistants in the office in Hartford, and it sounds like there is a lot of coordination and a lot of work that goes on between the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, the DEA, and the Hartford Police Department. Um, as I understand it, there are three different task forces that the Hartford Police Department participates in with federal authorities, um, and that those seem to be working productively and well. Um, and um, I, I also am aware of um, a ver various um, Project Safe Neighborhoods, Project Longevity, um, the various um, endeavors that we have where we try to address with state and local authorities the various issues, recurring issues involving violence and violent offenders who are re-entering the community. Um, and we remain very committed to that. And in fact, I understand that there was recently word that a substantial grant has been um, designated for the Hartford Police Department for funds to address some specific investigative resource needs. And I hope those will be, those will make a difference and help you in your mission. Um, we also have been working closely and are developing a good working relationship with the state's attorney's office in Hartford. And we have two assistant state's attorneys that are cross designated to work on federal cases alongside us. Um, so my primary reason for being here is to introduce myself uh, to offer up um, my name and so that you know uh, who you can call when you have um, issues or you have needs that the U.S. Attorney's Office and our federal investigative partners um, can meet. And I congratulate you on the, the great work. Some of those uh, gun and uh, fentanyl um, seizures were particularly heartening to see. Uh, it was very impressive work that's being done. So thank you for including me. Um, and it's very good to meet each one of you. And I look forward to working with you in, in the coming months. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Chris McKee. If I could uh, just add, I am the law enforcement coordinator. Um, we'll be working and assisting in, in all our efforts um, you know, between um, U.S. Attorney's Office, federal law enforcement, and um, the Hartford Police. Um, just to add what um, Chief Peck has, has said, um, the community of Hartford should be particularly proud of the uh, of this grant award that just went out to Hartford PD. It was a very competitive process. Uh, it was a statewide process, and uh, the fact that the Hartford Police Department is acquiring um, over fifty five thousand dollars to combat violence, the fact that they pursued this as assertively as they did, uh, and presented an incredible package and proposal, uh, something the community should certainly be proud of that their police department is out there working hard to uh, turn over every stone to uh, help increase public safety in the community. And the only other thing, if I may add um, to uh, Chief Peck's comments, is um, you heard Sergeant Mastriani and the Chief talk about Project Longevity. Um, I think it's important to know, and if you're a community member in Harford, um, that 
certainly there's a lot of enforcement and investigative work that is done um, in collaboration and partnership between our organizations. But um, you've heard the term community engagement and community service officer be repeated throughout the uh, course of this evening. Um, and I just want to uh, bring the point that not all of our work is solely enforcement based. Um, you know, we've had the great opportunity to partner with Hartford Police and other city agencies and non-city uh, non providers for uh, faith-based initiatives such as Faith in the Blue, which uh, occurred in the North End, a uh, particular uh, church in the North End of Hartford last October. We're looking forward at the U.S. Attorney's Office to participating again with Deputy Chief Watson and her staff uh, for that new that event coming up in 2021, as well as some other uh, faith-based events that are being scheduled through the community service officers. So thank you very much, uh, Chief, and everyone for having us in. Uh, thank you both. Um, the, we're excited. We just got notification of the Project Safe Neighborhood uh, Grant Award today, um, and it uh, looks like our our, our uh, Planning and Accreditation Division, in conjunction with some of our folks at VIN, did a, a, a very thorough submission, and uh, and that was recognized. So we always thanks uh, we always thank everybody for that that kind of support. Um, you know, it, it definitely goes a long way to help the the officers and detectives here do their job. Um, and, and we appreciate that the partnership uh, with the with the U.S. Attorney's Office. It's been uh, I, I they've they've got some um, some changes coming there uh, down the road soon, but all for positive things. I think some of our some of our attorneys are are going to be uh, are going to be future judges, which is which is great. Um, I just hopefully can ask somebody that they come here. <laughs> we want to see them as, as judges up our way. I don't think I don't think I have that kind of pull, but if I did, uh, we would certainly request to have them here. But uh, uh, also important to note that um, that Chris McKee is not just here for public comp stat. He actually joins us on all of our comp stats, which um, keeps him connected to the department, keeps us connected to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So I thank him for his uh, his dedication. He's here all the time. Uh, a great resource for us. So um, with that said, I think we're 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 pretty much right on time here for a seven o'clock closure. I will open it to uh, first to uh, Assistant Chief Howell if he has any closing remarks. Uh, no, no pressure. I just want to make sure I give uh, the, the assistant chiefs and the deputy chiefs a chance to uh, say anything if they wanted to. Yes, thank you, Chief. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, participating in the CompStat, um, uh, especially the uh, community. Uh, and as far as the department members, uh, I think you guys have done an awesome job. And I think the community uh, will uh, should be proud of the work that you've done. So I thank you all, and I wish you all have a good night. Better than New Haven, right, Chief? No comment. <laughs> Put you on the spot there. Um, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Watson. So Assistant Chief Medina is not here with us today because he is in a uh, he is in a, a training program at the University of Louisville uh, for uh, a Chiefs level training. So it was a great opportunity for him. We got a grant. Uh, scholarship to send him out to that training. So he is probably uh, sitting in a dorm room somewhere at the University of Louisville typing away at, at, a, at a paper um, that's probably due tomorrow. Um, so um, Deputy Chief Watson is, is our uh, acting chief of operations. So I'll just turn it to, to Deputy Chief Watson if you've got anything to say. Well, good evening. Is that me? I have to turn my volume down. Good evening, everyone, and thank you, Chief. Um, on behalf of Chief Medina, I'd just like to say thank you, everyone. Please keep up the good work. We're proud of you. On um, behalf of myself, I guess I'd like to say as the weather changes, I'll be able to participate more um, frequently. And um, thank you, Chris. Um, as you say, um, I will participate more so in community engagements as the weather changes. And I guess that's all I've got to say. Great. Thank you, and uh, I think we have uh, Deputy Chief Rendock. You got anything, uh, Chief? Uh, thank you, Chief. I'd just like to say good evening, and uh, I've got a call into Al Roker to give uh, Lieutenant O'Brien some uh, assistance on his street video. Thanks, Chief. He was. Uh, this is the reason he's a police officer. Stand-up comedy didn't work out. Uh, so thanks everybody for participating. Thanks to uh, all of our, our staff here at the PD for putting this together. Some great uh, visuals to try to make uh, 
some of these Zoom meetings that can be otherwise pretty mundane, uh, a little more interesting. We'll try to do some more field trips in the future. Um, I think everybody will enjoy that. Uh, and uh, thanks for, the, for our partners and for the community for being a part of our first COVID public comms that this will continue uh, back on its regular schedule of every third Thursday of the month at 530. We just did this one today because due to technology reasons, we weren't ready last week. So uh, we threw it off by having it on the, on the fourth, but uh, this will public comps that will continue every third Thursday of the month at, uh, at 530 in the evening. Um, so thanks to everyone and have a good safe night.